Welcome to Longevity Industries' presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I'm your host, Dean Phillips. I want to thank our sponsors, the Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation for all their hard work and contributions to our industry. I am fortunate enough today to have with me Bill Adler, who is the president and CEO at Stripmatic Products. He also is our past chair at the PMA for 2013. Welcome, Bill. Well, thank you, Dean, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, be part of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. Well, it's great to have you. And so we'd like to always get into it right away. What is your big key takeaway for our future? Well, Dean, I, when I thought of that, I, I almost have to break it into two separate. I look at it as external and also internal. And on the external takeaways in the next five years, I'm looking at how do we position our company to service the new applications with the autonomous uh, automobile and the electric electric vehicles, which are only going to be a growing portion of our uh, customer base. We're, we're over 90% automotive, so we're very tuned into that. And then to get there, looking internally, you know, we're looking at, uh, again, how to be globally competitive. We've got to look at our processes. How do we automate as much as we can? And then it's, we all have talked within our association meetings on the trouble of finding new employees, good employees to add to our, our staff. So that is one of the key elements in getting to achieve our objectives and being relevant in the future, in the next five years. And I think that is something that everybody wants to do is try and, as there's a book, called the race for relevancy and i think that's something that everybody looks at now is how do we become a player in this how do we stay involved in this because that's the bigger challenge uh is how do you stay connected how do you stay in that role that you're currently in i think that's a, a bigger challenge tell me your back tell me your background how did you get involved in the metal forming industry well, good question, Dean. Um, uh, it actually started as a adolescent when going to parochial school, coming from a big family, uh, we all had to work and pay our own tuition. So I, you know, did all the usual paper out stuff, but eventually uh, working summers between school, I'm working on construction uh, crews, uh, and the big one was when I got into college, I had the opportunity to work summers at the local, one of the local steel mills. So I actually got to work back, and I'm 62, so back then we still had ingot uh, mold. Uh, so I worked where they poured the steel into ingots. I worked on the electric furnaces. Uh, and then out of college, I got a fabulous job that uh, was selling uh, lifting equipment. So I got to be in every different type of factory, uh, back in the steel mills. I, I was in nuclear power plants, coal plants, automotive plants, and I couldn't wait to get up and see how somebody did something. So it was almost a great, I, I don't want to call it an internship, but I got to see what I really enjoyed, places where I wouldn't want to work. And this whole steel industry, which we're based in Cleveland, it was sort of a natural connection. Um, so I don't know if it was genetic or just my work experience. It was a real comfort zone for me. Yeah, that that is something, the on-the-job training aspect that you talk about there, it gives you a great broad perspective of what our industry is like and how it has changed too, because companies that were around, you know, going back even 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, a lot of them have 
changed or gone by the wayside. It's been part of the, uh, I don't want to say that, uh, the, let's, let's say that the change that's taken place in metals and in our industries along, especially along the Great Lakes, uh, which was where most of that industry resided for years and years because that's where the supply of materials was. Mm -hmm. Tell me what your biggest passion is for our industry. How, what gets you up in the morning and says, hey, I, I'm excited to be part of this? You know, I, I think the key word is challenge. I mean, you find your jobs that you do that might have been a challenge at one time, and then it becomes just something that you do. It's part of, you know, your core competency. But then staying in touch with your customers and like you're talking about, well, what's coming down the road? What are their objectives? You know, light weighting is probably one of the, the biggest factors that uh, have impacted the, the design changes. Uh, our 50% of the parts Stratmatic makes go uh, on suspension parts. Our customers, we make we stamp a tubular shape and they mold rubber around it to take vibration out of your ride. Another big component are on chassis and frame. So these are key areas that our customers are trying to squeeze every ounce they can as well as keeping it as low cost as possible. So when those new designs, and, and that's sort of one of our biggest challenges, is how do we get into the design stage of what's coming down the road three to five years from now? Because they know what we've done historically, but we would like to collaborate you know, with these new ideas and how do we help our customers achieve their goals. Yeah, I think that's, it, it, it is an exciting time. I was uh, speaking at a at a college recently, and one of the things that I, I told uh, this group of engineers was that this is an exciting time to be an engineer. With with all the new technologies, all the changes that are coming, this is, I don't know, a, 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 the new golden age of engineering, in my opinion, for, for what's out there. Have you looked at new technologies for internally within your plant and what are, what are the changes you're trying to achieve? You know, Dean, that, that's been a big part of uh, Stripmatic's path. My, uh, my wife and I acquired Stripmatic in 92, and they were almost out of business. Um, we did a business plan and looked at some of the jobs they were doing that we were not globally competitive. We moved that business out. And we focused on our niche die system, which are wrapped tubular shapes. And as we evolved, we got to do more challenging parts um, that really weren't considered doable. And, I mean, you can't defy physics, but the challenges in the die design, how can we get, you know, to this thicker material and wrap it around a smaller diameter which had not been done before. And then I'll give PMA a lot of credit through our networking and connections in PMA. Um, I was exposed to laser welding. And when we wrap our tubes, we've got a seam that many customers were asking us to have that welded, but we could never do it fast enough and uh, clean enough to really meet their uh, specifications until we got to the laser welding. Mm -hmm. Laser welding is now one of our key growth areas. And again, we, we now have two um, highly automated uh, laser weld cells and we're really on the step of cutting loose on a third laser welding cell. So, <clears throat> what started out as just a stamping operation, we took that niche, looked for added value, and what did our customers need? And this has been a great opportunity, you know, that took us two steps above, you know, what used to be our normal competition. Right. 
as as the president and and CEO of Stripmatic, what do you find are some of the biggest challenges when it comes to things like workforce development, and how do you see this changing over the next five years? Yeah, Dean, that, that's uh, everybody's biggest challenge right now. Um, we've been trying to add three people to a, a second shift <clears throat> since since the beginning of the year, and this is June almost. Um, so it's that difficult. Um, from the training side, we're just talking about bringing unskilled people that we can train internally and have them actually pretty productive in a short period of time. There's other, you know, more technical areas like setting up our laser cells. You know, that's going to take a little more training and uh, a longer learning curve. But we're not even talking about that. I'm just talking about staffing a second shift. And then we're looking at adding this third laser weld cell. Well, that's going to require more people, you know, and more training. And one of my dilemmas right now, we are so busy, we're hand to mouth with the current level of uh, order quantity that it's tough to make that decision to pull somebody off of production and allow that half an hour to hour training time we'd like to do per week. So I say that's the biggest challenge is a getting enough people in here so we can't afford to get back onto that, the training, you know, that we're trying to upskill our existing force. Right. I think, uh, I was at a meeting this past week, and that was one of the big discussions is that people are, are are struggling with not just the finding people, but how do you train them? And that's a huge aspect of, uh, I think, uh, a lot of the companies that are faced with that, whether they do that internally or they try to farm it out. Uh, it, it's something that has to be done whether it's just taking new employees and training them or taking existing employees that have been there and have a certain skill set and try and improve or add upon that, that skill set so that they can add you know, value. And Dean, on that point, uh, actually just this week, I attended uh, another PMA seminar that was geared towards their online training system, that metal mm-hmm. form EDU. And I'm looking at that as, you know, we could incentivize our employees to do this online training system on their time. You know, we're, we'll maintain our production level, but at, uh, at their own time, they'd be able to go through some of these training modules. So that's something that we're currently, we, we just acquired one of the modules uh, we just put our big toe in the water, and I was very impressed with what I've seen so far. But that's one of the tools we're looking at might be a good solution, you know, until we can, uh, you know, add more people to where we could pull some uh, time off during during our workday. Yeah, it's – there's no question about – you have to find that time, and that's <clears> – <throat> Excuse me. That's one of the things that I think most companies are currently challenged with is that time doesn't come from nowhere. You have to give up something to allow you to have that time. You know, it, it's just like in our own personal lives. There's Nobody doesn't have things to do. So what are you going to sacrifice in order to do something new or to add to your schedule? Is, exactly. Is our workforce currently, uh, since we have a lot of retirees and a lot of people moving out of the industry, what do we do to get uh, our younger people interested in it? Young engineers, young technicians, and, and bringing them back into our industry? Dean, it's, a, it's been a huge challenge. You know, I think uh, back in the late, you know, through the 1990s and 2000s, you know, I think our schools, 
teachers and, you know, counselors were advising their children, oh, you need to get into IT or medical, you know, manufacturing dead, it's going to all go to, you know, Asia, you know, don't go down that track. And I think people are finally realizing there is such a need and such a good quality of life in these career paths in manufacturing. Um, we're trying to get as many people as we can, and I'm talking students, parents, and teachers, into our plants and show them. I mean, my floor, you can eat off of. And I remember back in the old days, that wasn't the case. So right. there was some validity to, uh, you know, not being an ideal situation, but in, in today's manufacturing environment, you've got to be safe. You've got to be clean or you're not going to be competitive. Your customers aren't going to want to deal with you. So if we, and I have brought students and teachers in and the, the, it's great to watch your faces when they open the door and take the first steps into our shop, they see how brightly lit it is how organized everything is and it's, it just looks professional and we're a small company. We're only like 40 employees. Uh, but it, it just has that air of, you know, the, this looks is professional and it looks like it's going to be around for a long time. So it's almost been like an industry challenge to get that, uh, perception of manufacturing changed. And believe me, I, I know, unfortunately, we're working so much overtime. My guys are doing fantastic right now. And, you know, but you can work too much, but, uh, you know, too many hours per week. But anyhow, right. I, I think we are now showing people that this is a, a great career path. A four-year degree is not required. And there's a lot of opportunities here. I think that's a great message, and uh, we can all learn from that. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell me what your thoughts are, since you're, you're so closely tied to the automotive industry. What are your thoughts on autonomous vehicles and where that technology can take us? My feeling on uh both autonomous vehicles and electronic vehicles. Um, I'm not a naysayer. I think these have a definite place in our future with automotive and how our society works. I do not believe it's going to just overtake everything. I, I think it's going to find its niche. It's going to really help out, uh, get over certain challenges in, you know, uh, urban city traffic problems, cross country travel. I think there's definitely spots that these are going to be nice uh, improvements and how it's done now. But I, I, there's a whole group where I think the traditional automotive vehicles are not going to go away. There, there's, there's too many positive positives with them, but I think it'll it'll balance out. I, I think where autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles, you get that added value, or um, you know you can do other things, you know, work while you're tra- traveling. Um, I, I I look at that as it's coming. We're not going to stop it. And I don't want to stop it. I'm looking for opportunities there. And I think that'll add some new opportunities. I think the whole battery situation, um, it's something I've been watching. I don't know the components go into batteries. What do you do with spent batteries? That's going to create a whole new industry, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and personally, from Stripmatic's little niche, um, no matter what kind of vehicles, they all need chassis and they all need suspension. So I feel comfortable there. I just want to look at how do we position ourselves to maximize our value with any of those new developments. I think 
there's certain aspects of all vehicles that are not going to change and well or or not change in the way that we currently think of them now, you you still are going to need certain things to make a vehicle run you you're going to need some level of of a tire whatever that tire happens to look like in the future you're going to need uh chassis and suspensions what where are the innovations going to come from in that? Do you think it's material science or do you think it's more technology? I, I think it's, I think it's both. Um, you know, Dean, I was looking at, uh, I always thought how neat it was to have those monorails, uh, that float on, uh, electronic. Is, is that a magnetic Mag- track? Yeah, the magnetic ones. Yeah, that I thought switch hey, poles. That, right that that would be a great technology. It wouldn't again take over everything, but maybe a cross country um, track that would be ideal. It'd be quick, clean. Um, so I thought there's no wheels there. Um, <laughs> it, it's a different animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think from the material side. Uh, one of the areas I'm looking at, again, with our application, is can we use our wrapped steel tubes and combine that with a hybrid system of, let's say, carbon fiber, where we could achieve the uh, size dimensions that we currently can't do with just steel, but we could put a carbon fiber insert, get the profile that our customer is looking for, reduce weight, increase its strength capability. I look at that as a real uh, option that might be a game changer for both us and our customers. Yeah, that's exciting to, to see some changes like that and to have that on the horizon. You know, and that and that's kind of you know the destiny of manufacturing comes from is is what's out there just over that horizon, what's out there five years from now, and and what things can we do differently and improve on. I I think one of your ideas there is something that I've always said, even from the safety side of things, is that let's say that we've got a problem to solve and we see a solution that's going to solve thirty percent. 40%, 50% of the problem. Well, that's 50% of the problem. So let's let's look at that. Let's not dismiss it because we don't have a solution that encompasses 100%. Let's look at those changes and say, this can take us and, and make incremental moves that can improve things like safety and improve things like automation instead of dismissing it because it's not going to help us make all of our parts. I think that's where some companies get in trouble when they're talking about robotics or automation. They say, well, we can't do this on all the parts, so why should we do it? Instead of looking at, well, I don't have to do this on 10%, 20% of the parts, that's a huge improvement just in itself. Do, Do you see more companies in metal forming as well as just manufacturing as a whole starting to take a different approach to things like collaborative robots and automation and technology AI. Uh, do you see those, those changes being embraced more? I, to be honest, Dean, I don't know of my circle of, uh, friends in the metal stamping industry. I don't know any that are not looking out and how can you know there's not one that doesn't have an issue trying to grow their workforce well what's your option your option is how do i take that non-added value labor out and automate it and dean i'll give you one uh example we're working on right now we've got one of our biggest uh newest presses we've got a a, uh 300 ton servo press and we now uh, take parts off the press put them in a big container 
have to dump that container and put these in 35 pound max plastic totes. It kills me. I can't even watch when we double handle these parts. So we have a design on the board, and this is one of our current projects, whether it is a cobot or collaborative robot, I want these parts to come out the exit chute of the press, either a piece or weight count for that 35-pound tote, kick it to a I'm full position while the next empty tote is in place, so that machine never stops running. There's a signal for that robot, grab that plastic tote, and it knows where it goes on the skid that it gets nested on right next to the press. It's not double-handled. We're not paying for an extra human person, you know, that wouldn't be able to perform the same function as well as that. So now I've got my more highly trained uh higher cost press operator operating a second or third press while that cobot is handling all those parts and we don't have to double handle them. It's, it's a no brainer. I, I hope they have this done by September, but um, it's not an if it's just a matter of getting this executed or implemented right now. It, it's Funny you mentioned that. That was one of the things that uh, I've had over the last year discussion-wise is that we know that we've got some difficult challenges with our workforce, and it's accepting that and executing a plan to address it that a lot of companies struggle with. I, I think that uh, they they look at it and say, I, "I don't have the time. I don't have the. I don't have the manpower. I don't have the." the technical expertise in house to do certain things. So I think we're all challenged to create the time to do it. You, you need to force yourself to, to do those changes, to Im- make the improvements in the plant and to train the workforce. I think that's something we need to do. How do we uh, address getting kids more interested? Because they are, you know, as they say, that children are our future and, there's no question that we uh, we need to have people that that get more interested. I, I I know that there's a lot of new technologies that have really excited kids, like uh, all all the things we've talked about AI, talked about material sciences being in 3D printing and doing all those kinds of things. Is that how we at least get our foot in the door with the with the next generation of of engineers and uh, technicians and operators coming out? You know, Dean, I, I, I'm, I'm right with you on that. And we've had a little bit of, uh, we were forced into a situation where, again, trying to add the second shift on our new laser cell, I ended up having uh, two young men that uh, they're, engineering internships fell through last summer. And I said, we've already got our engineering intern committed, but I said, we really need help on this laser cell. You're going to be exposed to proc sensors, laser mics, uh, vision systems, and a lot of uh, vibratory bowl feeding and automation. And I said, if you want to, I go, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to get your hands dirty, you know, uh, just operating these. At the end of the summer, these two young gentlemen just raved about how much they enjoyed their experience working right on this equipment. And it, it got rid of any of that fear factor of, well, how difficult is it to learn? I, I think they're, they got so comfortable with all those systems I think they're chopping at the bit to get their degrees and to get out <laughs> in the real world so they can apply this. Yeah. Um, and I, one of them has called me back again and, uh, you know, he, he wants back in what's called PLC programming or ladder logic. You don't even need a four year degree for a lot of these, uh, systems to program for our automation systems. 
you know, there's some technical learning to it. It doesn't mean you need a four year degree for it, but it's so desired and sought after. This is a great skill. I would highly recommend people look at if they have that aptitude. Excellent. Well, Bill, it has been a pleasure. I want to thank you very much for being here today, but unfortunately we're out of time. This has been the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast, and I want to thank our hosts uh, and also our continued supporters of of the Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation. Thank you, Bill. Everybody have a great day.